Few sites can claim to have radically altered American archaeology upon their discovery, and the Monte Verde site located in Chile happens to be one of them. Monte Verde proved that people lived in the Americas prior to the Clovis culture, who were previously thought to be the earliest Americans, by at least 1,000 years. What's even more incredible is that the site has unusually good preservation, with organic materials like rope, hide, wood, and bone surviving in place for millennia. Within this incredible archaeological site, two stone projectile points were found, which I am replicating here. In this video, I flintknapped this stone point replica and discussed the significance of the Monte Verde site. I begin my replica projectile point from Monte Verde by removing large pieces, called flakes, from a chunk of basalt with a hammer stone. I also remove flakes with a large antler tool called a billet. The first step is to remove large masses of material and contour the piece of basalt for more controlled flake removals. Soon, both faces are covered in the scars from flake removals and an edge is established all the way around and the piece is now called a biface. For years, it was thought the first indigenous people of the Americas were those of the Clovis culture. Clovis technology begins in the archaeological record at approximately 13,500 years before present and is known for skillfully made points with a distinctive technology called fluting. Clovis artifacts occur over a broad range throughout southern Canada, most of the contiguous United States, and into Mexico. Archaeologists debated whether or not Clovis people were actually the first in the Americas, partly due to a lack of comparable archaeological materials from Northeast Asia, where the ancestors of indigenous Americans are thought to have originated. Excavations at the Monte Verde site in Chile between 1976 and 1987 provided the crucial evidence to prove that people were in the Americas well before Clovis, providing solid dates of 14,500 calibrated years before present. It still took decades since this discovery for mainstream archaeologists to commonly accept the pre-Clovis model. The Monte Verde site is actually a complex of four sites known as MV1, MV2, Chinchahalpi 1, and 2. These are spread out over approximately 600 meters along the north and south banks of Chinchahalpi Creek in Chile. The most important discoveries were at MV2, which is what we are discussing within this video. MV2 is an open-air archaeological site which would have been located within a damp, cool, temperate rainforest 14,500 years ago during the late Pleistocene. Recovered from the site are not only stone tools and projectile points, but bones from extinct fauna, a wide variety of plant remains, wooden objects, hearths, and the collapsed remains of two tent-like structures, and even human footprints. Preservation was so good at MV2 that not only wooden artifacts were preserved, but seaweed was also recovered by archaeologists. Among the most incredible of the finds were tent stakes, which exhibit cut, fire-hardened tips, and flattened heads from being hammered into the ground surface. Cord was tied around these with double slip knots to secure structures. Other wooden artifacts recovered include wooden mortars, digging sticks, a wooden lance, architectural timbers, and much more. Besides the wooden artifacts, stone tools were found, which include bifacial tools, unifacial tools, flake tools, and ground stone tools. A nearly complete lanceolate point and a point midsection were recovered at the site, which is what I'm replicating. Both of these artifacts were made from fine-grained basalt, a tough to work material which is what I'm flintknapping here. Besides basalt, quartzite and rhyolite were also used to make stone tools. Spheroid stone artifacts, which were pecked in ground rather than flintknapped, are thought to have been used as bola weights to entangle game animals. In addition to the stone projectile points, there is also a bone artifact which is thought to have been used as a projectile point. 
I continue to remove flakes to thin and shape my basalt biface closer in appearance to the artifacts found at Monte Verde. Basalt is difficult to work, more so than materials like flint, shirt, and obsidian, with flake removals often not ending in smooth terminations, which makes it more difficult for subsequent flake removals. As a result, I am careful to remove flakes that not only thin the piece, but also contour its surface. The goal is to make the biface as regular as possible, which will make the finished point more effective at piercing and cutting its target. The remains of two structures were found at the MV2 site. The first of these is a long tetlite structure, made of wooden poles and animal hides. Wooden stakes were found associated with this structure, still upright in place with cordage tied around them and wooden poles. The floor of the structure contained hundreds of microscopic flecks of hide tissue, possibly indicating that the floor was covered in animal hide. The interior of the structure contained hearth pits lined with clay, around which were scattered stone tools and the remains of edible plant foods. Outside of the tent structure were two larger communal hearths, wooden mortars, and grinding stones, as well as three preserved human footprints. The second structure at MV2 was wishbone shaped, made from wooden uprights set into a foundation of sand and gravel. Elements of elephant-like gomphotheres were butchered and had their hides tanned in and around the area of the structure, and stone tools and wooden tools were also made in and around the same space. Researchers also identified 18 probable medicinal plant remains inside the structure, many of which are used by the Wajite people who still live in the region today. Archaeologists have interpreted the second structure as non-residential inflection. These artifacts and features show that food production, tool production, tool maintenance, and shelter construction were activities undertaken within the MV2 space. Animal remains at the site suggest that people were eating gomphotheres, paleolamas, rodents, birds, amphibians, and freshwater mollusks. There are also remains of edible seeds, nuts, and berries, which were recovered from the larger residential structure. Aquatic plants and seaweed were harvested from freshwater marshes and lagoons, and even wild potatoes were eaten. Based on the range of food remains, archaeologists think that the Paleo-Indian people at Monte Verde were practicing a generalized foraging economy eating a broad spectrum of both plant and animal foods. Now that my replica is close to the finished dimensions, I use an antler tool called a pressure flaker to press off smaller flakes. These removals are small, but very controlled, and are useful at contouring the piece and making a refined, sharp edge. This allows me to shape that biface to my desired dimensions, including making a narrow tip with less risk of breaking it than using direct percussion to do the same thing. The incredible preservation at MV2 was due to unique environmental conditions. After the site was formed, the area became a bog that covered the archaeological remains within a layer of peat. This bog later became a stream basin, which kept the site saturated. Peat kept the artifacts from experiencing bacterial decay, and the saturation kept the artifacts from drying out. Carbon dating was performed on a number of samples taken from the site, which include the wooden artifacts, bone, seaweed, and charcoal from the hearths, resulting in a median date of 14,500 calibrated years before present. Monte Verde was the key piece of evidence for archaeologists who formed the Coastal Migration Hypothesis. A previously widely accepted hypothesis for how the Americas were settled was the Ice-Free Corridor Hypothesis. This idea posited that people, usually Clovis culture people, migrated from Beringia into the interior Americas in a gap between the Cordillerian and Laurentide ice sheets just prior to 13,500 years ago. Some research has shown that this route may not have been viable for human life at a time frame suitable for the earliest Clovis sites, and particularly 
for a pre-Clovis site like Monte Verde. What is more commonly accepted is that people migrated from Beringia into North and South America along the Pacific coast, possibly with the aid of watercraft. These coasts would have been free of the Ice Age glaciers which blocked interior travel and would have been more equitable for human life. These coastlines were quite possibly host to rich kelp forests, which would have provided a wide array of marine food sources for early Americans. MV2's preservation of organic artifacts is not only incredible for a late Pleistocene site, but for any archaeological site. Usually it's unique for any bone, especially wood, to be preserved in the archaeological record. At Monte Verde, a dearth of wooden artifacts have been preserved, providing a wealth of information on the lives of the people who lived there. The dates from Monte Verde's organic material have been crucial in demonstrating that people lived there in the Americas earlier than 13,500 years ago, and likely used a Pacific coastal route to access the continent. The importance of Monte Verde is hard to overstate. The site is an invaluable piece of the puzzle for understanding the peopling of the Americas.